The following segments are pre-recorded and sponsored by Longworth Productions. Saving money on your energy bill. I'll try it today. Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Longworth, and welcome to another edition of Try It Today, coming to you once again from the beautiful Senior Botanical Garden in Kernersville. We'll tell you more about them later on. And later on is when the famous roundtable shows up, and we'll get into all sorts of controversies there. Between now and then, some great guests, important information coming your way, including a surprise guest who's doing some kind of art thing. We're going to find out what that's all about. She's doing it right now. You can't see her. But anyway, what we want to start out doing is talking about energy savings and different things, ways that Duke Energy is helping us as customers. My good friend on my right, Jimmy Flythe, of course, Director of Government Community Relations for Duke Energy. And Jimmy brought along a special guest with us. Logan Koreska is Lead Communications Manager for Duke Energy. Came up from Concord today, but from Winston-Salem originally. Good to see you. That's right. Good to see you, too. Good to be here. Jimmy, with cold weather upon us, uh, does Duke Energy have any resources to actually help customers on this? Yeah, we really do. There are a lot of tools that customers can use and a lot of tips and things they can do to help save energy. And so I wanted to invite Logan to come up. She helps a lot with the communications around those topics. And so I thought it'd be great to have her. It's timely and um, to share some, some tips that will help customers out. Absolutely. Logan, let's, let's talk about ways, you know, kind of various kinds of assistance that are available. And so let me first ask you about budget billing. What is budget billing? Sure. Budget billing is a program that Duke Energy offers for our customers here in North Carolina. And there's there's a couple different options. But the great thing about budget billing, it's it's certainty around your bill. So right now, it's, it's a hard time for people in general. You know, with money, we know things cost more. We know that bills can be scary sometimes. And so it's a way to know exactly what you're going to pay every month. And so there's a couple different options with that. One is a 12-month option. So a year, you pay the same thing every month. And then in month 12, there's a settle up. So we look at the, the plan you were on versus what your usage was, and we'll either, right. you'll owe us or we'll owe you kind of thing. Right. Um, there's also a quarterly option with that. So you can, again, pay the same thing every month, and every third month we're going to adjust your bill automatically just based on what you're using. That's, so great. That's the, a great thing. The, the 12-month, you have to have been in the, the location for about, for I think 12 months prior to enrolling, but the quarterly you don't have to. Right. Now, is this the same, do you have to be a homeowner or can you be a renter? Um, I believe that. it can be, be either one. Either one. Mm -hmm. You just have it? to have for the 12 an established um, right. billing history in that location. Gotcha. Now, what about the Home Energy House Call Program? Mm -hmm. Tell folks what that's all about. I love the Home Energy House Call Program. This is It's a free program, again, for customers in North Carolina. We will send a specialist out to your home, and we'll do a walkthrough with you. And basically what we're doing is assessing your energy efficiency in your home. So we'll look at a couple of different things. So we'll look at things like um, your weather stripping. We'll look at your air ducts. We'll see, you know, how well you've caulked and sealed your home, your insulation in your home. We'll look at your appliances. We'll see if those are outdated or maybe you could use a more energy efficient refrigerator or things like that. And then we're going to give you a customized report just for your home that shows wow. some different ways that you can improve your energy efficiency. And you know, you can take that and use it how you want, but ultimately what our goal is is to help you reduce your energy cost and your bill. Yeah, because each of those things sort of mount up like that. Let's talk about the thermostat settings. How much, mm -hmm. this is a big thing people do bait all the time. The, uh, thermostat settings, does that have any impact on my energy bill? It can. So when you're home in these cold winter months, you really want to keep your thermostat as low as you can comfortably tolerate. We don't want you to be freezing, of course, but right. a, a great way to think about it, you know, and, and we is the lower you can keep it, you know, or the closer to the temperature outside. You know, of course, when it's 30 degrees, you don't want to turn it down that far, that's, that's true. but the lower your bill is going to be. Right. So, I mean, but if I, but if I keep changing the thermostat, does that make a difference? So it, that is less about changing the thermostat. It's more about the time in which you do that. So if you go out of the house for a couple of hours and you want to bump it down, um, that's not going to really affect it. And a smart thermostat is a great way to do that. But if you're in the home and you decide you're cold and you bump it up and then you change it back down, that fluctuation is causing your system to work really hard. I have hard. 10 seconds here. What Can I still decorate all my trees and everything and save energy? You can. LED lights, light emitting diode, they 75% they less energy. They're a great investment. Why do you guys like to help customers on this saving energy stuff, Jimmy? Yeah. You know, Jim, with the population growth in the Carolinas, 
know, we've got a great business climate. You're seeing more people drive electric vehicles. So the demand for energy is growing in, in the Carolinas. And we're going to have to add some general, some resources along, you know, while we're trying to transition to cleaner energy. But then, you know, the bottom line is, is energy efficiency is just another tool that we can help meet that demand or lower the demand on, in the long term. Uh, absolutely. Up on screen, duke-energy.com is the general website to Jimmy and Logan. Uh, happy holidays. Thank you for sharing this information. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, we appreciate it. Thanks. We'll be right back after this. Everyone could use a little help with their bills, especially these days. At Duke Energy, we're offering easy ways to help keep your energy bills more manageable. With programs that allow you to pay the same amount each month or pay in installments over several months. Plus, special financial assistance from the Share the Light Fund for those facing hardships. We're Duke Energy, and we're here to help you. Need help buying food? Everyone needs help sometimes. Food Nutrition Services may be able to help you buy food and free up your money for other expenses, such as utilities and medicine. To receive FNS assistance, households must meet income limits. You may be able to get assistance even if you own a home, car, land, property, or have a retirement plan or money in the bank. Second Harvest Food Bank of Northwest North Carolina team members can help you with the application process over the phone. To receive help or if you have any questions, call 336-422-7758. Hi, I'm Jim Longworth reminding you that Try It Today is now streaming on WFMY Plus, available free on Roku and Amazon Fire TV. Back now on uh, Try Today, and uh, you know, you think about different types of diagnostics and medical procedures, but we don't always think about having a scan of our lung. And I want to talk about that with an expert. Dr. Caroline Childs, a radiologist with Atrium Health Levine Cancer and professor of radiology at Wake Forest University School of Medicine by way of MIT and Duke and Stanford, and we're so glad you're here. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. So how prevalent is lung cancer in America? Let's start there. It's very common. One in 16 people will be diagnosed with lung cancer in their lifetime. So we see it very often. Well, now, how many patients usually come through? I don't have to hold you to an exact number, but how many patients usually come through for treatment at Levine Cancer each year? And, and how many locations would they go to? I mean, give me sort of an idea of the scope. So at uh, <clears throat> Wake Forest, we're Levine Cancer Center is a National Cancer Institute accredited comprehensive cancer center. So we're uh, a catch uh, for patients throughout Western North Carolina, parts of Virginia, West Virginia, uh, will be referred into us. So we see more than just what we would normally see in Winston-Salem. So we, we have a lot of patients. Um, and and what, what, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but what, what can I do to, or what can anybody do to lower their risk of getting lung cancer? So the most common risk factor for lung cancer is cigarette smoking. So the best thing it, to lower your risk is to never smoke. If you are never smoked before, please don't start. It's, it's, it's a terrible, terrible habit to have. If you are a cigarette smoker, then you, we have ways to help you quit. Some people are able to quit on their own and others need assistance. We have three interventions that have shown to be very effective in helping people quit smoking. And one of those is nicotine replacement therapy. You've seen uh, patches or gum that people right, can take right. to replace the nicotine from cigarettes. Also, counseling can help. This could be individual counseling or group counseling as part of a, a uh, smoking cessation program. Right. And then lastly, we have medications that will help people. Some people can quit on their own. Some people need one intervention. Some people need all three, but we know we can help you. So to, to find out more about these resources, you can call a toll-free number 1-800-QUIT-NOW, and they will help you find what's available for you. Now, why, why uh, who should be screened. I mean, you don't just walk into the, you know, the diagnostic center and say, hey, I think I'd like to have a lung screen. I mean, who should do this? So this is, uh, the eligibility criteria are people who are age 50 through 80. They've smoked uh, at least 20 pack years. So the way to calculate pack years is multiply how many packs of cigarettes you smoke per day 
times the number of years you smoke. For example, if someone has smoked a pack a day for 20 years, that would be 20 pack years. If they've smoked half a pack a day for 40 years, that's 20 pack years. We need someone to have smoked at least 20 pack years. If they have quit smoking and they've quit within the last 15 years, they're still eligible for screening. I know it sounds like a dumb question, but why are these screenings so important? With screening, we can find lung cancer at the earliest stage, stage one. And when we find lung cancer at an early stage, the likelihood of the patient being alive in five years, what we call our five-year survival, right. is very high, over 90%. That's totally changing our perception of what lung cancer as a disease is. That's good information, Doc. I appreciate that. I want to put something up on screen here, wakehealth.edu slash lungscreen, or you can call 713-LUNG to set this up. And uh, I hope you'll come back sometime because you have an interesting uh, personal history, and I want to find out why you went into medicine, those kind of things. Will you come back sometime? I sure will. All right. We'll be right back after this. You know, it's hard to believe the Safe Sober program has been going strong for over 30 years. And over 600,000 students have made the pledge to stay safe and sober on prom night. You know, Griff, it's had a huge impact on our community. Yeah, you're right, David. And now we're making sure the message continues year round. So everyone can join us in supporting our students. Learn more and take the pledge at safesober.com, sponsored by Daggett Schuler. What are you waiting for? Your future awaits at Guilford Technical Community College. Make amazing happen. Back now on Try Today, and uh, my late father, rest his soul, used to have a favorite phrase of his. People say, how you doing, Mr. Longworth? And he say, I'm aging nicely. But well, we have two very special guests with us to help people age nicely. And a return visitor to the show, Adrian Calhoun, is director of the Area Agency on Aging for Piedmont Triad Regional Council. And the young lady that she hired and is pleased with, I guess, or she wouldn't have brought her here, Miranda Taylor is regional long-term care ombudsman for the agency. And good to see both of you. Thank Pleasure you. to be here. Thank you. Adrian, let me start with you. Uh, what, let's remind folks what the mission of PTRC is all about. Sure. So the mission of PTRC is to improve the lives of our community through creative regional solutions. And the aging part of this uh, comes into play. Why is that so important that you guys focus on that? Well, we strive to be experts on all aspects of aging and help older adults and their caregivers live meaningful lives with independence and dignity. We are passionate about bringing awareness to issues that impact older adults, right. like our Age Well programs. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up. So uh, your special guest, as I said, is Miranda. Tell me about the Age Well evidence-based program. What's the mission? What's the main objective? Absolutely. So we offer a variety of Age Well programs from um, chronic conditions like diabetes to addressing the fear of falling and the risk of falling. And our objective is to empower our older adults in the community to live the lives they need and deserve to live. And you have a lot of classes that, you, that, that are taught to help people understand this? Absolutely. So they're all evidence-based and have been proven to offer better health outcomes for our older adults. And I think, uh, I think, excuse me, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I, I think Adrian sent me an email one day about the fact that, that you like to use volunteers to actually teach the classes. Now, why is that and what kind of impact does that have on the program? Absolutely. So volunteers are vital to the success of our programs, and we encourage volunteers from all walks of life to help out with our programs. There doesn't need to be any teaching or healthcare experience background our volunteers need to have. They just really, we look for a commitment to helping older adults in the community and to helping and serving people. Now, can the volunteers be of any age or they need to be elderly? They can be of any age, um, and again, just really wanting to learn and help serve our community in that capacity. So if I wanted to volunteer, I mean, is there a, a training process or something that I would go through before you turn me loose in there and say, go ahead and do this class or what? Yes, so we do offer a comprehensive training to all of our volunteers who want to become leaders at our office here in Kernersville. We also prepare them as well as possible and give them all the necessary tools, both kind of emotionally, mentally, and physically. Uh, we didn't rehearse this, but I'm gonna embarrass Miranda by asking you, Adrian, 
What is it you saw in Miranda that you hired her? I mean, because she seems to have a passion that you share for this topic. What did you see? In well, her? again, those, you know, we really strive to be that expert. And Miranda came out of a gerontology program that showed her desire and the passion to work with older adults. And from the get go, Miranda never missed a beat. Anything that we had going on, she volunteered to raise her hand to be a part of the solution. And so that's that passion that we look for with old, working in this department and serving the older adults. That's right. So did we embarrass you enough? I mean, that... No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. uh, up on screen, I want to do this uh, Piedmont Triad Regional Council. Now, the abbreviation you'll see on the website you can go to is ptrc.org, or you can call the general number, which is 904-0300. That's ptrc.org, which I hope you will check out. Adrian, thanks for all you do and for bringing along Miranda, and uh, we just appreciate everything you're doing for folks. Thank you so much. Thank right. you for having us. We'll be right back after this. Are you looking to jumpstart your future in the fast-paced, rapidly growing food industry? In Second Harvest Food Bank's Providence Culinary Training Program, you'll learn the craft and art of cooking, plus business and management skills, science and nutrition, and essential life skills. Providence Culinary Training has helped hundreds of individuals just like you launch successful culinary careers. There's no reason to wait to turn your passion for food into an exciting career. Check out the upcoming class schedule on our website at ProvidenceWS.org. Hi, I'm Jim Longworth, reminding you to catch my column, Longworth at Large, and Yes Weekly every week. It's available throughout the triad, or you can go online, yesweekly.com. Back now on Triad today, I have a very special guest with us. She's been here throughout the program. You just didn't see her. She's back behind the camera. Now she's in front of the camera. Laura Ashley is an artist and speed painter. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having me. Well, my pleasure. Now, when did you first develop an interest in, in art and painting? Oh, I've always loved painting. I've painted and like any time that, um, you know, we were doing any projects growing up, I mean, from when I was like four. In school and stuff too? Yes, always grabbing a paintbrush. That was really? just my method. Did, did uh, any of your family members, parents, siblings, anybody have an interest in that or that's just something to you? Not, I didn't find out that anybody in my family um, did art or had any interest in it until I had decided to do um, studio art in college. And then my grandma told me that my dad used to draw. How about that? The I know, the but I've never are... seen any of his stuff or anything. Really? Is there any around? We might want to, you might want to look into that. I need to look into it. The, now what it is, what is speed painting? Tell me what speed painting is. Speed painting is, it, it's technically where you paint something in a time fashion. I personally, in my world, I call speed painting 15 minutes or less. Right. Um, my fastest painting is two and a half minutes, and that's my eagle during the national anthem. All right. Now that brings us to the fact that you were hiding out in the back, and the audience couldn't see until just now, but you were working on a, a speed painting of, of me sort of sitting here, and you have sort of a process. Now, do you always work with live subjects? Or do you sometimes work from photographs or do you do both? How does that work? I like both. Um, I do like to use photos as reference beforehand just to plan and have an idea. And then I like the energy of the room right. when I get there. All right. Now, of course, behind us is this ugly guy, Jim Longworth, that she painted. But I she, don't think so. Well, she made me look uh, uh, pretty good. And now, how long did this one take? I know you were behind the scenes while we were doing the rest of the show. How many minutes did that take? Um, 30 minutes. I just checked. Okay. Uh, now, I happen to know that you do a lot of your work for charities and with charities, because you and I have been in events with my wife, Pam, and, and things like for Richard Petty and some of these other uh, foundations. And you'll do things that uh, people will then buy at auction. What, what, kind of, what kind of organizations and charities? I mentioned Richard Petty's. I mean, what kind of things do you do? Um, so I'm the official speed painter for Richard Petty's Petty Family Foundation. And so they'll hire me for most all of their events. Right. I also work with Jeep Beach um, in Daytona, Florida. Right. And I worked with NASCAR Foundation, and then I just worked with Gary Sinise's foundation. Wow, Gary Sinise, the guy that was in the Forrest Gump movie. Yes. That's very active. With Lieutenant veterans. Dan. Yeah, Lieutenant Dan for that. And 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 really, it, when she just mentions foundations, it's hard to to think about it. But if you you see her at some of these events. 
Uh, she'll be speed painting, and then people pay big bucks. They'll auction on them, and then the money goes to the charity that you're at, which I just applaud you for. I think that's great. Thank you. Um, now, if an organization uh, wanted to, an agency or organization wanted to contact you, uh, to do something and contract you to do a, a painting. Uh, is there a website or something that you have that people can go to? Yes, they can go to LauraAshleyLiveArt.com. Laura Ashley, all right. And I'm that has all my info. It does. I'm going to say it again on screen, LauraAshleyLiveArt.com. And I'm really flattered that uh, you did this. And again, you, one thing that you made, it was totally accurate, you made my hair uh, jet black which it actually is, looking at the camera, it's just totally jet black. So thanks, I'm, I'm kidding, of course. Had she done a full body <laughs> thing, she would have showed how ripped I am, but yes. she didn't do that either. Mm -hmm. Thanks for doing this, you just do great work. You're welcome, thank you so much for having me. This has been a fun day. All right, <laughs> check out that website, LauraAshleyLiveArt.com. We'll be right back after this. Every cookie sold in the Girl Scout cookie program helps girls learn lifelong lessons in people skills, decision-making, money management, goal setting, business ethics. From one generation to the next, it's amazing how much you can learn from a cookie. The Girl Scout Cookie Program. Think outside the box. Back now on Tribe Today, just about time for the round table, but a quick shout out to the good folks here at Senior Botanical Garden in Kernersville. It's all festive. You need to come out here and see it. Lots of great stuff. Speaking of lots of great stuff, we have three great folks with us. On our right, uh, Dr. Don Martin, he is uh, chairman of the Forsyth County Board of Supervisors. He's uh, sort of filling in for uh, Ogie Oven, who's a little bit under the weather. TV star Rosemary Plyman is here, and she's helping out today. And Keith Granberry, especially, it's being his might needs help. Uh, Keith is founder of Helping Hands uh, <laughs> Consultants, and we're ready to go. All right, guys, let's do it. Presidential candidate Nikki Haley recently proposed a new law that would require all social media users to correctly identify themselves and not use nicknames. Critics say this would violate privacy laws and censor speech. Who's right, Haley or her critics? Don Martin. Well, probably her critics. However, I agree with her, and, but, and even if you had the law, I think it'd be hard to enforce. All right. Rosemary. I mean, we, we, we'd like to there to be better safeguards around what you see on social media, but really you just have to be a better user of social media and be able to discern what you're reading. I don't think this is the way to change it. But Keith, I mean, people sort of become anonymous when they put little funny names up. Do you think they should put their real names up? Absolutely not. I mean, is she is she mad because she has critics who she can't point out? I mean, what's what's the real issue behind her trying to do that? I mean, it doesn't make sense. Social media is so vast that you can't even regulate it. Yeah, it is bad. Speaking of social media, Facebook and Instagram say they will allow political ads that claim the 2020 election was stolen. Now, should the Department of Justice jump on this and prosecute these social media platforms the way they would go after election deniers? Don, what's your opinion on this? I think not, and I think that it's, it'd be kind of unconstitutional. I mean, I, I think absolutely, you can say, if you pay for an ad, you can say what you want to. and truth Even if it's false. Absolutely. Well, it happens all the time. Are we going to go after everybody that... Uh, this fabricates various uh, campaign ads. Rosemary, what do you think? Yeah, the person paying for the ad or making the ad, it can be the one at fault. Um, you know, I think it's a, it, it would be nearly impossible for social media or sometimes any media in that point to be able to discern exactly what's fact from what people are paying to put on the air. Gee, somebody put up a lie about an election and should they be punished? Or? Absolutely. I mean, we know it's a lie. I mean, this is not something that's built on reality. And if it's a threat to the Constitution, See, that was a threat to the Constitution. We saw what happened at Capitol Hill. So right. I don't think that you can just let that go by like other things. Because it could grow into something Absolutely, else. Absolutely, which it did. Which it did. All right, California recently made it legal for the state to share gun owners' personal information with researchers 
who are studying the topic of gun violence. Now, it sounds pretty good, research is, research is important, but are you okay in general with sharing gun owners' personal information? Don Martin. If the personal information does not include their name um, and, and their address, I'd say probably their name and address, but other than that, if you're, if you're collecting sort of the demographics, I think that's great for our research. As long as they're doing data, but not to... Right. Not personally identifiable. Rosemary, what do you think? I'm okay with them actually sharing it, um, as long as there's an opt-out, like there would be on any privacy policy when you're signing up for a website or something. I think that, that the, the user needs to be aware it's happening and have a way to opt out. Keith, what do you think? Sharing I, the I personal like information? What she said. I don't think you should be sharing personal information because they use that in a variety of ways. I think that all should be personal unless they, uh, they themselves say you can. I don't think it should be allowed. Yeah, it's kind of a trust issue. Isn't yeah, it? Absolutely. An increasing number of drugstores are openly displaying and selling adult sex toys. Now, given that young people go into these drugstores, are you okay with the stores selling these kind of items out in the open, Don? I, I, I have a problem with that, I think. I, of course, I could always go take my feet and go somewhere else, right? Uh, you know, to shop. But uh, if it's everywhere, that would be that would be a little difficult. Or go to online shopping for well, uh, yeah, the, but the privacy thing. But Rosemary, you're a mom. I mean, do you want your kids seeing those things in the drugstore? I mean, do you do, do we think they first of all are they going to know what it is at a certain age? Probably not. I don't. And at the age that they do know what it is. They're seeing it other places too, and this at least is a reputable place. It's a drugstore. It is controlled. This is, you know, it's part of life. Okay, you have a section in the CVS or Walgreens called Family Planning. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things going on there that they actually that that are part of this this issue. So I don't think it's anything wrong with it at all. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Britain's Bristol Airport recently erected a prayer room which is actually like a bus stop shelter outside and along the curb. Critics say this so-called multi-faith area is nothing more than just a place to get in out of the rain, maybe smoke a cigarette. Either way, would you like to see all airports create a prayer area, Don? Well, probably anything generally, I think, that promotes prayer in this world is probably an okay thing. Right. Multi-faith room. What do you think, Rosemary? That I, I just don't think it's necessary, honestly. Is it something people are crying out for? I'm, I would be surprised if so. Yeah, this is like the first that, that I'd heard of. What do you think, Keith? Airport should have a prayer room or a prayer area? I don't I, I don't really care. I mean, it doesn't really make us... I mean, what are they using it for? They use it for a variety of things. So if there's a room where people can go and pray and smoke or whatever, uh, I'll, I'll allow them to have that. It doesn't really matter. I go into mine and pray that you won't show up. That's what I... Well, well you right pray that there. I'm here. Yeah, That's what you'd be here. praying. <laughs> You, and, uh, you, you hate it when I'm not here. All right, guys. You finally, <laughs> finally, a new a new beer a new beer is being made in San Francisco that's brewed with bath water. Guys and gals, would you drink beer made from bath water? Don Martin. Well, if it's sanitary, I mean, if it's sanitary and it tastes okay, I think you know, taste is a you might do it. And if it's not going to make you sick, yeah. What do you think, Rosemary? Beer from bath water? It'd be hard to kind of just get bath knowing what was in it. I think. For Keith, me. would you drink beer from that was made with bath water? Only my bath water. <laughs> That's the only bath water yeah, I would Yeah, you, you and Rosemary do bath Because my bath water is pure. Yeah, bathtub. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, that's, that's all the time we have. Oh, except for this. A man in Iowa has been collecting pencils since he was in first grade, and he found out last week that he now holds the world's record with 29,000 pencils in his collection. His wife said, that's great, honey, but what's the point? <laughs> See, the mm. pencils have a... Mm. Keith and Rosemary are going to make some bathtub gin, so we'll, they'll be back next week. I'm Jim Lawrence. We'll see you next week.